Are you ready to hear how Japan went from zero to a mighty empire? I've got a juicy history tidbit for you. So, let's rewind the clock back to the 6th century AD. We've got an incredible ride that starts with the Asuka following the Nara period in Japan, filled with blazing fights for power, sneaky assassinations, insane buildings that survived despite the earthquakes, and get this, there's a larger-than-life prince who has graced Japanese currency more times than anyone else in history. But hey, some historians doubt if this prince was real at all. Let's separate facts from myths and embark on a journey through time. The Asuka period is unique because it was the first time in Japanese history that political drama and power struggles took the spotlight. Picture this, the Yamato government had control over most of Japan. The Yamato court, the ruling family, was determined to make Japan a force to be reckoned with. Two big players in this political theater were the Soga and Mononobe clans. They were like rival gangs fighting for supremacy. And guess what sparked their feud? The adoption of Buddhism. The Soga clan, with their Korean and Chinese connections, were all for it. But the Mononobe clan resisted, making it a battle of religious preferences. The Soga clan won, and Buddhism seeped into every nook and cranny of Japanese politics, society, and culture. Now the Soga clan had a clean way to throw around their weight. They went as far as putting their own puppet emperor on the throne and calling the shots behind the scenes. So enter Empress Seiko, the puppet, the first of eight sovereign empresses. She was like the rock star ruler. The great queen herself moved the imperial capital to Osaka. But hold on because her right-hand person was Prince Shotoku and boy, was he a game-changer. Prince Shotoku was no ordinary sidekick. He was a genius influenced by Buddhism and Confucianism, and he had big plans to transform Japan. He introduced a system of 12 court ranks that was all about being virtuous, humane, and righteous. It was like a ranking system for the coolest and most honorable folks in the kingdom. Prince Shotoku made diplomacy and trade happen with Sui Dynasty in China, built epic Buddhist temples, and oh boy did he deliver. In the year 607, Horyuji Temple, 122-foot-tall pagoda, all made of wood, that survived 46 earthquakes with a magnitude of 7 or higher, till today and he even had a 17-article constitution up his sleeve, laying down the rules for everyone to follow. It was like a guidebook for being an upstanding citizen. He brought cultural exchanges in Japan to a whole new level. Now here's the cream of the crop, there's a bit of a legend versus reality situation going on with Prince Shotoku. Because of his status as a saint-like figure in Japanese Buddhism, some of his achievements are shrouded in mystery and debated by historians who also doubt he existed. After Prince Shotoku's death, the Soga clan tightened their grip on Japanese politics. It was like they were ruling with an iron fist, and people weren't too thrilled about it. Cue the dramatic moment in 645 when the Fujiwara clan, Prince Naka no Oi, also known as Emperor Tenji, with the help of a low-level government official named Nakatomi no Kamatari, took matters into their own hands. Things got wild, Nakatomi, Prince Naka, and others who conspired to eliminate the main figures of the Soga clan, planned the Ishii incident. The Soga no Iruka and his father Amishur, bosses of the Soga clan, are assassinated. Then they staged a palace coup and set in motion a series of reforms famous as the Taika Reform. It was like a breath of fresh air, a moment of change that would redefine Japan's political landscape. The Taika reform introduced a fancy new system called the Ritsuryo. It was all about fair land redistribution, standardized taxes, and a more centralized government. Japan went through different political reforms ramping up the Ritsuryo system, cultural growth, and a few emperors until, picture this, we enter the 7th century, and the imperial capital decides to switch things up and move from Osaka to Nara. Nara became the happening spot for the next 75 years. That's how the Nara period started. It was like a roller coaster ride filled with surprises and international flair. The government had a nifty centralized structure, improved Ritsuryo system, it was like a well oiled machine, and social mobility was a thing. People were moving up in the world based on merit. If you had mad skills in Chinese learning or knew your way around Buddhism, you had a ticket to power. The game was taken to a whole new level. Here's the cherry on top, the Nara period was all about culture and religion, and at the forefront of this cultural explosion was Emperor Shomu, who had been groomed for greatness since childhood, and was all about improving the lives of his people. He saw Buddhism as the key to achieving both personal happiness and national peace. So, he went all in and infused Buddhism into his government like a boss. 
One of Emperor Shomu's epic moves was the founding of temples in every province, this system called Kokobunji. Each temple had a seven-story pagoda and a statue of the Shakyamuni Buddha, the big boss himself. But Emperor Shomu didn't stop there. He had another trick up his sleeve, the creation of the Todai Temple. This temple, located in the capital, was like the cherry on top of the cultural sundae. And what made it even more mind-blowing was the huge bronze statue of the Virakama Buddha inside. The Nara period was like a massive cultural potluck, with influences from all over the world. For example, the consecration ceremony of the Great Buddha in Todai Temple was led by a high priest from India. And the music? It was played by musicians from all over East Asia. In the Nara period, Japan also had its eyes on the Tang Dynasty in China, a powerhouse that extended its reach from the central plains of China to Mongolia and Siberia. The Japanese government sent official missions four times to the Tang court. They even sent a bunch of students to study in China, like an international exchange program. But amidst all this internationalism, Japan still showed mad love for its own traditional cultural forms. One shining example is the Manyoshu, a collection of over 4,500 ancient and contemporary Japanese poems. It's like a poetic time capsule that covers all walks of life, emperors, aristocrats, priests, farmers, soldiers, and even prostitutes. They all spilled their hearts out in these poems, expressing love, family bonds, and the beauty of their land. These poems stay true to traditional Japanese spirit, hardly influenced by Buddhism or Confucianism. It was like capturing the essence of Japan in poetic form. Now, here's where things start to sizzle. After Emperor Shomu passed away, the marriage between Buddhism and politics caused some trouble. Temples became super wealthy, and monks started dabbling in secular affairs. It was like mixing oil and water, never a good idea. But fear not, same as in the Asaka period, the Fujiwara family, descendants of Nakatomi Kamatari, rose to the occasion and saved their people from abuse of power. Here is where things took a surprising turn. The emphasis on Buddhism started to weaken the Fujiwara family's influence. In the late 8th century, a powerful priest premier named Dokio gained immense power, especially under the reign of Emperor Shomu's daughter. The Fujiwara nobles were like, whoa, this priestly dominance is not cool. So they kicked Dokio to the curb and put a new emperor, Conan, on the throne. This new emperor wasn't as keen on Buddhism, and he wanted to restore balance. It was like a power shift, bringing things back to normal. And guess what? Conan's son, Emperor Kamu, took it all a step further. So he moved the capital from Nara to Heian. That's where the Heian period started. Oh guys subscribe now to discover more of the wild twists and turns that shaped our future.